My name is Leanne O'Neill. I use she and they pronouns. I'm a partner with Allyship in Action, a central organ based equity and social justice consulting firm, as well as the president of the board of Ben Bikes, which is a grassroots advocacy nonprofit that advocates for the safety of all people who bike and bend. Today, we're going to chat a little bit about building a more inclusive, sustainable and equitable mobility system. But first, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the space that we're in today. Before white folks called this place Central Oregon, it was a place where indigenous people lived, traveled, traded, fished, and thrived for generations. Those indigenous communities include the Northern Paiute, the Wasco, the Klamath, and the Warm Springs people and others. The displacement of indigenous communities was formalized when the US government coerced tribes into giving up the right to live on the lands that had traditionally sustained them and relocated them to reservations. I acknowledge my privilege as a person who is not indigenous to this place and who has benefited greatly from the displacement of the people who are. I aspire through my work and my personal life to honor this land and work in solidarity with the original stewards of our environment. To provide a little context, uh, you can see where the city of Bend is today. The brown areas are the lands that were ceded, uh, and then the tribal lands are what's in pink. Uh, the rest is really managed quite a bit by the uh, federal government as well as some by the state government. So just to provide a little framing around our conversation today and why diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important to the climate change conversation, I was really struck by this uh, quote by Elizabeth Pierre, uh, who's the co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance. Climate change is the result of a legacy of extraction, of colonialism, of slavery. A lot of times when people talk about environmental justice, they go back to the 1960s or 70s, but I think about the slave quarters, I think about people who got the worst food, the worst health care, the worst treatment, and then when freed, were given lands that were eventually surrounded by things like petrochemical industries. And then to bring this concept and this conversation around equity to transportation, uh, Adonio Lugo, who's an urban anthropologist and mobility justice strategist, uh, shared these words. When I started mapping how we have tied race to space here in the US with segregation, and how that fed into car culture, people wanted to be able to drive to their neighborhoods where they wouldn't have to be around diversity. I started to wonder what is going on here. Is there some way that we can make people feel like transportation is for them if we're also addressing some of these legacies of racial inequality? So that brings us to uh, the conversation that we'll have today uh, that will be kind of really surrounded in a case study around Vision Zero, which is uh, a strategy that we brought in from Sweden and from Europe uh, to really encourage sustainable transportation uh, to reduce and eliminate traffic fatalities and severe injuries amongst all road users, but specifically the most vulnerable users, including folks who walk and bike. It was really grounded in right, engineering and design around our road system, education, enforcement, and then evaluation. And enforcement is where we kind of get ourselves into a little bit of trouble when we bring in solutions that were created in really homogenous uh, cultures to a place like the U.S. that has a really profound history of oppression and racism. So some of the uh, considerations when we're looking at any initiative, plan, policy, strategy are, and especially within transportation planning, are where do low-income residents and communities of color live relative to essential services, jobs, and schools? Where is or isn't mobility and multimodal transportation infrastructure developed? Who walks and rides bikes for transportation as lifestyle choices and who does it out of necessity? Who is the most impacted by policy decisions or disproportionately impacted? And whose voices are not being heard? Uh, in mobility and transportation planning and decision making. So what Vision Zero did not take into account when it was initially brought over to the US uh, was that our low income residents and communities of color are more likely to live far away from essential services, jobs and schools due to a lack of affordable housing op options and housing discrimination. Low income housing areas and areas where communities of color live are less likely to have multimodal transportation infrastructure like sidewalks and bike lanes and safe street crossings. In high income areas, about 90% of streets nationally have sidewalks, whereas in low income areas nationally, only about 40% of those do. Uh, these folks in these neighborhoods um, are also um, people who are more likely to walk and ride bikes out of necessity, as they are less likely to be able to afford a vehicle, but they also have farther to travel, which means they are left vulnerable on our roads for longer periods of time. It is unsurprising then that low-income folks are two times more likely to be killed than, uh, than high-income folks 
uh, while walking and the black children are two times more likely and Latinx children are 40% more likely to be killed while walking than white children. Middle income and high income residents are more likely to walk and bike as lifestyle choices. And they're also more likely to idealize European ideals of bike commuting like we see in the Netherlands, which is relatively homogenous and does not have similar histories of policing like the US. So when we look at Vision Zero, it is really grounded in the assumption that social identity does not contribute to safety. And that was its initial failing and that's what a lot of folks are looking at now to see how do we apply an equity framework due in part to amazing advocates like Tamika Butler and others, we have started to have those conversations about, yes, we want cars to slow down, we want to reduce fatalities, but at what cost? Law enforcement and traffic stops is the largest percentage of interactions between the public and the police in the U.S. So when we see black cyclists like Dijon Kizzy, who was killed this month by law enforcement for a traffic violation, Philando Castell, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Samuel DuBose, were all black car drivers that were killed after getting pulled over by the police for minor, minor driving infractions. Black folks are five times more likely to be stopped and searched than white folks. So then people started saying, yes, okay, we're gonna do speed cameras. That is gonna solve the bias in traffic stops. And it is important for us to take a look, what are the in equity impacts of increased fines in the speed cameras, right? When we're looking at people experiencing homelessness, low-income people and people of color, they actually may be disproportionately impacted due to, for example, tickets being mailed and not being able to keep up with ad current addresses of folks who may have to move frequently. We see that a lot here locally amongst our low-income folks. A $100 fine impacts someone making $20,000 a year uh, far more greatly than someone making $100,000. The DC Policy Institute actually did a study that showed that increased fines didn't increase uh, the amounts that were paid, but rather increased the debt to the government, which can lead to suspended licenses and other dire consequences. Recent bias crimes here in Deschutes County uh, also show that vehicles are often used as, as almost weapons or, or uh, tools of those crimes, right? We've seen protesters being smoked out. Personally, I was intentionally run off the road near the Franklin Tunnel by a driver uh, screaming out the window for me to go home where I came from. I'm also subject to sexual harassment uh, on almost a daily basis while riding my bike. So when we look at the way that identity plays into safety, it is not just the speed of vehicles. And we need to look at these holistically to ensure that folks have what they need to feel safe walking and biking so they don't feel like they need to get into their cars. And the reason why I believe we are not seeing these conversations happening enough it's because when we look at active transportation and cycling advocacy and who is determining our transportation policy, I'm looking at our local government officials, transportation planners, executive directors, CEOs, board of directors, even the makeup of this conference. Whose voices have power and decision-making authority? Who was invited from the beginning and whose voices like mine were added as an afterthought? So just to be fully transparent, I was asked just two weeks ago after this full conference had been uh, put together to come and speak on this topic. I've also been asked what makes an organization anti-racist and how can we help other organizations be anti-racist? The single most influential thing you can do is to put black indigenous people of color voices, LGBTQ voices, voices from historically marginalized communities and positions of power in your organization. Allyship in Action is a majority woman-owned, majority queer-owned, majority person of color-owned company. Ben Bikes, two of our three executive offices are women of color. That's how you get those voices. That's how you get that equity framework uh, and get those conversations prioritized. For those organizations, though, who aren't able to do that, at least right now, right? We have, there's an acknowledgement that it can take time to create that sort of uh, internal change. We can take a, um, some guidance from the Green Lining Institute, who did a really amazing job putting together 12 mobility equity indicators to provide a framework for folks to really assess and weigh the benefits and burdens of transportation plans and projects with an equity analysis. And they really divide these about, between increasing access to mobility, reducing air pollution, and enhancing economic opportunity. And they really, really embrace that interconnected piece of all those systemic barriers and the systemic impacts of uh, transportation equity. There will be a full, more robust uh, 
uh, tool that they provide that will be, I'll have included in my uh, list of resources at the end of this presentation. But the thing that I want to really highlight that they do a great job of embedding in their, uh, in their framework is making sure to get input from low income people of color and other historically marginalized communities at the beginning of any plan or project and not to do it as an afterthought to let that guide the process and also to let that guide the decision making. So to honor the short amount of time that each of the panels has here today, I've got uh, links and uh, the resources that I have referenced here in this presentation today, including the statistics as well as the racial equity lens to fines and fees and that mobility equity framework. If you've got any questions, uh, I think we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. Uh, you can reach me also at the first email for Ben Bikes related issues or at the second email if you're interested in allyship in action. Thank you.